Welcome to the Property Renovation Podcast with your host, James Woodham, giving you the best tips on achieving the perfect renovation whilst making it as fun, safe, and as cost-effective as possible by hearing from experts in the industry and people that have been through the experience themselves. Let me introduce your host, three times award winner of leading renovation website, House, and over 15 years in the industry, renovating just over 200 properties, James Woodham. Hello and welcome to the Property Renovation Podcast. Well, this is our first episode of what I hope to be many. And the reason why we've come out with the idea of doing a podcast about property renovation is because I think it's needed. It's needed now. And definitely from some research that we've done, it will benefit a lot of homeowners, contractors, and other professionals such as designers and architects, but most importantly, the homeowners. This is the reason why we've done it. You'll be able to come here and you'll be able to download each episode. And the aim of this is so that you can discover more about the topic of renovation in a different way and walking away with knowledge about renovation uh, so that you can go off and you can, you can do this with confidence. And we hope to give you some tips and tricks of the industry as well by interviewing building contractors and designers and architects. But mostly what's going to be on this is episodes about everything you need to know. And this can be right from topics on anything that you need to know before a renovation, such as finding a good contractor and what to do to receive a good quotation and how those quotes should be itemized and what you need to do about deposits and schedule of works. What if there was a dispute with a building company and how you need to to manage that as well. And then right the way through to during the works about communication and how to get the best out of your building contractor with communication and, and how you should be communicating with them and about safe working and quality checks and how you check on the work so that you can make sure it's done to the standards that you're looking for. And then anything to do with afterworks, such as testing the products that have been installed in your property, about building control approval and what you need to do to have your works signed off, about guarantees and warranties, and also the final documents, what documents you need to receive from your building contractor once the works have been completed. And this is this is just a tip of the iceberg of what we're going to be discussing on each episode. Today, we're actually going to start with contracts. So just as you're about to hire a building company and you think, right, okay, these are great. I want to hire these. And then they all, they send you their contract. Now, essentially a building, a contract between you and the building company is just a binding agreement. This is an agreement between yourselves that the company needs to have signed so that these works can start. And it's something that makes them feel secure and hopefully it's designed to make you feel secure as well. So it should be balanced. The contract should be balanced in terms of what you will receive out of this and what they will receive out of this. And amongst this contract, it should contain the terms and conditions as well. But I've got a list of things that it should consider, of what I believe it should consider, what we believe it should consider. And these are just the minimum. So every contract should have the building company's registration and full address. And that's a given. It has to have that. It should also contain the address of the works that are being carried out. Now, that might sound very easy to say um, because it would be your property, but not necessarily would you be living there? Maybe it's a second property or a property that you rent out, or um, maybe you're, you're running this contract for a friend of yours that lives in a different country and it's their property. So you always need to make sure that the right address is on that contract. It should also contain the date of the contract that it was issued, and it should also contain the date of when the work is going to start. So if it's planned to start in the next couple of weeks, then you just need to look out for that. The next thing it should contain is the length of 
how long the project's going to be, whether this is four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, 10 weeks. You know, projects can last all different lengths of time. Really does depend on the complexity of the work, whether it's gonna be works outside and whether it's gonna be reliant on the weather as well. So lots of things need to be considered, but ultimately it needs to give you a length of time of how long that project is gonna be. It should also contain some financial information as well, such as the amount of deposit that the contractors are looking for. Now, with the deposit, this can really range. It can range anything from no deposit at all to 20%, 30%, 50%. It really does depend. It also does depend on whether you're asking the building contractor to purchase some materials other than the raw materials. Maybe you've asked them to purchase some appliances for your kitchen or for your bathroom. So they need to have that money up front so that they can make those purchases. But ultimately they, they need a deposit. A lot of companies need a deposit so that they can pay the first week of wages to their team to do the work, but also because they are relying on you to say, yes, I want these works done at this time and that you're not going to cancel at last minute. They need to feel secure that they can rely on you to agree to those works to start and that they're definitely going to be doing the job. So this is where the deposit comes in. It should also contain how much the total cost of that project is gonna be. And uh, this means including VAT as well, if they're VAT registered, but it needs to be broken down with labor and raw materials or labor and materials but um, it needs to give you a total overall cost of the project now with that comes along with a payment schedule and the building contractor may be wanting to be paid every friday of every week that they're on the project or maybe they do it a different way maybe they're asking for a series of payments maybe four payments spread throughout the project in terms of a percentage of work done and where they are within that. So it's always good to just check that out and make sure that what's fair is fair and those payments are clear on when they're expected to be paid as well so that you can keep a good idea on your cash flow and understand what is up and coming and what's due to, to be paid to them. Another thing that it should contain is about the hours and days that you have agreed with the building contractor to work. Now, a normal building company would work anything between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. Monday to Friday, but it could also be that they work on Saturdays too. If you allow them to work on Saturdays, you will more than likely find that the overall project schedule will, would be reduced. So they would, in, in theory, be finished a lot faster. But if they are restricted to, to just Monday to Friday, then it would probably be extended by another week or so. It depends. But it's always good to just make that clear and, and have a chat with your neighbors as well and uh, say to them, listen, I've got this building company that's gonna be working for me. Would you allow them to work on a Saturday? Or, uh, you know, they're gonna be working minimum 8 a.m. till 4 p.m. Monday to Friday. Some of your, your neighbors might oppose to that. They might suggest that they don't do any noisy work after 3 p.m. or before 9 a.m. or something like that. So it's always good to just check that out before signing the contract so that you don't get yourself into a situation where your neighbors are complaining and you've already authorized for those type of works to be done at those times. And then it comes down to the building company's terms and conditions really. And there could be just a few terms and conditions that they have, or there could be a couple of pages worth. So really, really go through that in fine detail. Read it through and again and again, just to make sure that it's really clear as to what the fine detail is. But ultimately, there should be a couple of things in there, and these are five, six of them. The process of what happens if there is any extra work that's required. Now, if you can imagine, they've already quoted for the main job, but there probably hasn't been any allowance for unforeseen work. And by this, I mean, if they're going in and they're ripping up the floor and they're taking all of the tiles up and they need to put a new floor down, the, the substrate, the support underneath that floor, they won't know the condition of that until they take off the first layer. And it's only then you really actually realize that extra works can occur because they want to make sure 
that they leave this job in a long lasting manner. And to do that, they would raise if there are any issues with any supporting factors that contribute to the main finish of the job. So just be aware of that and make sure that you understand the process with the building contractor. Usually the way that it works is that you would have a variation of contract. And by this, it's a clear document or a clear agreement that says from the building contractor, we have discovered that this works is extra and it needs to be done. This is how much it's going to cost you. This is how long it's going to take. And do you agree? And really, they shouldn't be doing the work until you have had that chance to look at it, maybe receive a second quote, but ultimately just having a look at it, getting familiar with the costs and then being given the chance to agree or not. Then you should never be thrown into a situation where they've done work and then they're billing you for it and expecting you to pay because that doesn't really, it's not really fair. They shouldn't have done that work in the first place and it doesn't really give you that much chance and you can't really do anything about it in that term. So the fair way to do it is give you the chance and then you can decide what you want to do about it. Then it should also contain something about the process of what happens if the building company goes over schedule. Now, they've probably agreed with you that it's eight weeks, eight weeks to do the project and they go over by a week. The impact that that could have is that you are renting another property. So you're, you're staying somewhere else and you only allowed yourself eight weeks. So you're going to now have to pay for another week. Or it could be that you're staying at your parents and you have to contribute to the, the food or you've had to travel further and you've got more petrol, more travel costs to think about as well. So there's a lot of financial factors that add to this, but also it's a personal issue. It's, a, it's an inconvenience if schedules go over and you're having to, your, your life is already upside down. So, you know, it's best to, to keep that to a minimum and uh, it can really be upsetting if schedules go over. So if a schedule goes over, you need to have the discussion, say to the building company, hey, what's going on? Why is it going over? Why is it taking longer than you originally agreed? You do want to be really clear about your facts when you go to them about that, because if there have been any extra works, then that's probably a, a big contribution to the extension of the, of the schedule and the reason why they've not finished as to their agreed original date. So you need to just, first of all, check all of that out first. If there has been any extra works, maybe have a little bit more of an understanding and flexibility as to when they're supposed to be finished. But if they haven't, then you need to just be finding out why they've gone over schedule and what they're going to do about it. Are you going to be compensated and when it's going to be done? Then you need to know what happens if they damage any items in your property. Now, usually the way it works is that they would be confined and limited to a certain working area. And you need to factor in that they're always coming in through the front door or through the back door or through the side of the house. But they're not necessarily going to be going into your bedrooms unless they're working on them. So you can just shut the doors behind them and that would minimize any damage. But you need to just have an understanding of what happens if something is damaged. And a good idea is to go through at the beginning, before any work start, go through with your contractor and note down all of the existing damage in your property with where they're going to be working or where they're going to be coming through and get them to agree that that is what they see. Take some photos to support what you've written down and then do another one. Do another one at the end of the works and walk through with the building company. And if there has been anything damaged, then it's more than likely, unfortunately, going to be one of their team that's done it. Now, usually if they've damaged something, they'll probably own up and they'll probably say to you, yeah, we've damaged it, we're gonna fix that. But you need to know exactly what their actions are, what's gonna happen if they damage something in your property, are they going to fix it? And how long is that gonna take as well? So it's, it's always good to just make that clear and do some checks beforehand as well. And then you need to know what happens if you withhold any payments. Now, there could be a really good reason why you're not willing to pay the building contractor. Maybe you believe that you've paid them too much. Maybe you've overpaid them. Maybe there's a bit of a mix up as to when the next payment is due. 
and you don't believe it's due yet, but they believe it is. So it really is good to just have that discussion with them and what happens if you withhold any payments. Does the work stop? Does the work pause at that moment in time? Do they continue whilst they're discussing the withholding payment? There are so many reasons as to why financial discussions happen within a project. It could be just simple. You know, you're not happy with the work that's been done so far. You'd like them to correct it before they progress any further. And you're not willing to pay any further until then. So it's always good to just have that in writing as to what the procedure is, what happens, what you're gonna expect from them. Do you need to give them in writing maybe seven days notice that you're not going to be paying the next payment unless they've met the milestones that they've agreed to? And then you just need to talk about the guarantee of the work. So they've finished the project. How long have they given you a guarantee for? Is it a year? Is it five years? It really um, is good to just get that clarified. It can really range. It can range from the main structure of what they're building. Maybe they're building an extension for you. And that may be two to three year guarantee or it could be limited to just like the installation of the bath and installation of the basin, for instance. And because you use it every day, then it could probably be only a guarantee of a year. So just to make sure that there's no leaks and there's no mistakes within the plumbing work and stuff like that. A year is the minimum really that you would expect. Ultimately, like I said at the beginning, a contract for any renovation is a firm agreement with a clear set of principles and an understanding between you and the contractor. And yes, it should always be there to protect both parties, but don't forget having a conversation as well really does help. Hiding behind emails and complaining about a building company doesn't really get you far. You do need it to support your complaint or the issues that you want to raise, but try having a chat with them first, face to face, the traditional approach and see if you can get anywhere that way and get them to understand your position and what your concerns are. And if there are any good building company out there, then they're going to be more than willing to communicate with you face to face, more than willing to accommodate you. It's your house, it's their reputation, and they're only going to want this to come out with a good ending and something to look at, to be proud of and something that you can finally say, I've achieved that too. So I hope that this has been a great episode for you and please subscribe to our Facebook page or our other social media. We're going to be growing our social media marketing a little bit more. So we'll let you know a bit more about that. You can go on facebook.com forward slash the property renovation podcast. And if you've got any questions, you can put them within the group and um, ask away. We'll hope to get back to you as soon as we can. And yeah, subscribe to the podcast. I have no doubt that it's going to be of benefit to you if you're renovating any property in the future or now. And I will speak to you soon on the next podcast. Thank you very much.